anything from me and my beloved black cat, Ptolemy. This poem is going to be about infrared astronomy. Now, what is infrared? Radiation with wavelength longer than that of red light, so we can't see it. Now, you'll see me now in white light, ordinary light. Just suppose you can see me in infrared light. As you can see, my monocle's dark, and so is Ptolemy. And we have infrared telescopes, and they tell us a great deal. A great new telescope has been launched, the Herschel Observatory, containing the largest infrared telescope ever launched. In fact, the largest telescope ever launched. With me are two experts, Professor Derek Ward Thompson and Dr. Chris North. Welcome to Sky Night. Now, first of all, um, Chris, there's a model of the telescope. Will you please take us through it? Well, this is a uh, 1 to 10 scale model of the uh, the actual Herschel satellite. So the real thing is about the size of a double-decker bus. So the actual Herschel satellite has got a, a main mirror that's three and a half metres across, which makes it the largest uh, mirror ever launched into space. And that focuses all the light down to the secondary mirror and then down uh, into the instruments uh, within. The instruments are in the top of this black can here. This is a large cryostat. And on launch, it contained about two and a half thousand litres of liquid helium to keep everything cold. And there are three instruments in there, two cameras and one spectrometer, which uh, can analyse uh, the light and identify individual molecules and, and elements. And the instruments, uh, they're not just infrared cameras, they're far infrared cameras, which means they're looking at very long wavelength, light with a wavelength a few hundred times that of the, the light we see with our eyes. Where's the telescope now? The telescope, Patrick, is at a place called the Lagrangian Point, which is a very high orbit because... Oh, how high? It's several times the distance of the Moon from the Earth, and it takes exactly one year to orbit the Earth. Consequently, it's always in the same place, opposite side of the sky relative to the Sun. Because it's not just cats that glow in the dark, telescopes do too. As we can see from your telescope here, Patrick. Pete and Paul are in the dome of my 15-inch telescope, getting rid of the night's observing. As you can see, the walls are cool, and the telescope's glowing. That's why we have the cool telescopes down for this kind of work. So what we want with an infrared telescope is we want to keep it as cool as possible, we want to keep the cameras as cool as possible, hence all the coolant on board, and we want it to be in an orbit quite far from the Earth so that it doesn't overheat from the radiation from the Earth. Well, so far, everything has gone well. Herschel launched a year ago. Uh, it took a few months to uh, start observing, and we've just had the first results have come out. Now, this isn't a Herschel image. This is a region of somewhere in the constellation of Taurus, Taurus the bull. Yes. And you can see across the centre of the image, there's dark patches. So this is a visible light image, and the dark patches uh, are, are dust, and they're blocking the, the starlight behind. And they're just essentially silhouetted yes. in, in this image here. When we look at them with Herschel in the far infrared, oh. it's an entirely different picture. Derek, this is your territory. Yes, I mean, this is really exciting now. You can actually see the detail of what was just dark clouds in, in the optical. You can see this very extended cirrus clouds, but you can also see the dense, bright regions, all of those spot, bright spots you can see in the image. They're all regions where stars are forming right now um, or have recent, very recently formed. And one of the great advantages with Herschel is it allows us to see this very, very earliest stage of star formation. The analogy is seeing a, a silhouette of a person on a hill. In, in, if you just see their silhouette, you can't see much about them. As soon as you actually see them lit up, you can actually start to tell... Well, you see dust. What are they made of? Mostly they're made of silicate, the same as sand on the beach. Although, of course, the particles are much smaller than the typical mm. grain of sand, more like the size of uh, cigarette smoke. Yeah. Oh, what's this? Well, this is a region of the sky near uh, the star Polaris, uh, which uh, a lot of people will know. In the far infrared, the image is very, very different. You can see this uh, dust all over the sky, and this is something called galactic cirrus, we call it, just like cirrus clouds on a, a vaguely cloudy day. What's it made of? It's made of dust. This is clouds of dust. This is very tenuous clouds of dust, and you can see it forming filaments. Of course, the, the cirrus wasn't first discovered by Herschel. It was discovered by Iras. Yes. And it wasn't predicted by anyone before it was seen. 1983. That's correct. And when people first saw it, they descri described it as cirrus because it looked just like cirrus clouds uh, in the sky. But the, uh, the thing about Herschel is now it can detect the cirrus at longer wavelengths 
but also can detect the, and, and discover the denser regions in there. This image contrasts very nicely with, with the, the next image, which is a region in the constellation of Aquila. And uh, this image is a lot more colourful. So Polaris is, is nowhere near the plane of our galaxy. Uh, Aquila is right in the plane of our what galaxy. What are the colours? Are they false or are they really well, there? Well, the colours are false colours here. What you're looking at is what you would see if your eyes were sensitive to the infrared. So we've made blue to be the shortest wavelength infrared, red to be the longest wavelength. So if you could see in the infrared, this is what you'd see. And the blue areas are the hottest areas where the most massive stars are forming. And the red and the orange areas are the cooler areas. Some of the dust we're seeing here is only 10 degrees above absolute zero. And we're still detecting the heat coming from so that. That blue area really is um, a stellar nursery. It's it certainly is. Very massive stars being formed there. Yeah, in the centre of there, there are, there are a number of, of large stars that will be forming and, and kicking out a lot of uh, a lot of heat that's that's warming up the dust around it. And this dust is in the process of, of collapsing. So there are some tiny, tiny uh, red and yellow regions, which are regions where much smaller stars will be forming, and eventually they'll be stars in their own right. Yeah. Well, we're talking about star formations. Um... How exactly does that happen? Well, Patrick, we're not 100% sure. We know it must be gravity. Gravity of the, the self-gravity of all the material there pulls itself together uh, and eventually the density in the centre becomes hot enough for nuclear burning to start and a star switches on. But as for the details of that process, well, well, we're really still in the dark and that's one of the questions we're hoping Herschel will answer. We certainly know that stars give out a lot of uh, very intense radiation when they're oh, formed, yes. and it's one of the uh, one of the big problems is very high mass stars, more than about ten times the mass of our sun. Our th all our theories say that they shouldn't be able to form; that that they and should yet be kicking out. There. Yeah, we indeed. see them. <laughs> we <laughs> so we know yeah. they form. Betelgeuse itself uh, is uh, yes, indeed. Yes, I mean that's uh, about thirty times the mass of the sun. So that's a prime example of uh, a star we can see that we simply can't explain its existence. And that's one of the reasons why we launched Herschel. This is a strange view. What exactly is it? This is a star that's just formed in the centre of this region here, and it's blown a cavity in the interstellar medium. What by? It's wind. It's a stream of, of very energetic charged particles that we're familiar with coming from the sun, but of course far more massive stars have much more intense streams of particles. And what's exciting about this picture is just around the rim, at the lower part of the rim there, you can see a bright area where a new star has just formed triggered by the wind from the previous star. <clears throat> you said a triggered star formation. What exactly is that? Well, Patrick, that's, that's a good question. We, we don't know what it is that starts star formation off or what triggers it, the, the formation of stars. One of our theories is that stars that have recently formed, the wind and the interaction from those stars actually triggers, as we say, the gravitational collapse of the next generation of stars. And this is a really exciting image because this is the first time we've had a direct picture of one star triggering the formation of another. I mean, one of the interesting things about this is that this star is, is probably going to become one of the highest mass stars in the galaxy. It's currently a mega 10 times the mass of the sun. And the largest stars we know of are about 100 times the mass of the sun. But we don't know how they form. And this is one of the, this is a chance to observe them in the process of formation and, and try and work out how this, how this happens and we form these, uh, these very massive stars. Catch them in the act. Yeah. Indeed, <laughs> yes. Well, uh, we have some other spectacular views too. We were talking about stellar winds blowing cavities. Well, we're all familiar with the idea of the wind on the Earth blowing waves over the surface of the sea. We believe this is what's happening in this shot. We've got the oh, wind yeah. from, from a number of massive stars just out of shot to the right, blowing this, this great giant wave of new star formation um, across the whole of the interstellar medium. And there's so much going on in this image. This is actually on the edge of the Rosette Nebula, this image, so in the constellation of Monoceros and the stars in the centre of the nebula are off to the right of the image uh, and they're what's creating these winds and what's actually heating up the material on the right. You can see that it looks bluer than the material on the left and as you go outwards towards the left the material gets colder and colder but even in the cold regions there are still stars forming some of these little red uh, red blobs again there. Spectacular pictures and everyone tells us something new. This is another interesting uh, interesting wind but in a different in different light. Uh, so this is a, a, a bright star just south of the Orion Nebula uh, NGC 1999 is yeah. the name of the nebula 
And, and you can see a dark region to its right. Now that was seen in optical images uh, and that was thought to be a cloud of dust that's very cold and so wasn't shining at all. It's been looked at with other infrared at shorter wavelengths so we knew it wasn't warm dust. And the expectation was that when we looked at it with Herschel we'd see that it was a cloud of cold dust. And in fact when we look at it with Herschel in this image it's still dark which means there's no cold dust there. And that means it genuinely is a hole in the nebula. The star is actually mm. blowing a hole uh, in the nebula, a hole through the, through the gas and the, through the dust. Holes in the heavens. Uh, <laughs> to to and mm. I would hazard a guess that quite a few of them will turn out to be that way when we look at them with Herschel in more detail. There are other galaxies too. And of course the Herschel will examine other galaxies as well as ours. It will indeed. So uh, if I just skip to a, an image of another galaxy. Ah, the Here's whirlpool. A, Indeed, the Whirlpool Galaxy uh, M51. This was actually the first image that Herschel took just after it had flipped its lid to let its instrument see the sky for the first time. So a very tense moment for uh, everyone trying to use it. And that had to go right. And, and yeah, I mean, there were certainly a lot of cheers in the, uh, in the control rooms sure when that were. came down. <laughs> also, of course, the first galaxy to be seen as a spiral by Lord Ross That's right. way back in 1845. Yeah. Another interesting galaxy. This is, I think, M81. Indeed it is. Uh, this is uh, M81 and uh, just uh, above this image is the, the galaxy M82 which is nearby and there was some debate for a while as to whether some of the material that was seen uh, between the two was actually being uh, pulled off one of the galaxies just by gravity, by the gravitational interaction. You can see at the top of this image the wispy structure. What Herschel has been able to do is show that that's actually material in our own galaxy. Uh, and that it's it's material that's just in the foreground essentially, and it's one of the one of the uh, challenges we're looking at uh, other galaxies that our own galaxies gets in the way almost. But indeed. But then the other problem with Herschel is it's been too sensitive. In the background of this image, you can see things that just look like static little dots, but in fact these are all real galaxies, real distant galaxies in the background that we can detect with Herschel. We're seeing them as they were billions of years ago. The light has taken billions of years to get to our telescopes. And so we can do a survey of them all. And uh, here we see something called the Herschel Atlas, or part of the Herschel Atlas. This is a region of sky that's four degrees across, which is eight full moons on a side. Uh, and it's showing thousands of galaxies. Almost every single dot in there is a distant galaxy, seen as it was billions of years ago. And one of the things that this is doing is letting us see normal galaxies back at that stage. Because, of course, the further away we look, the further back in time we look through the universe. And we know these, some of these galaxies, as you say, are 10 or 12 billion light years away. So we're seeing the light that left them 10 or 12 billion years ago. And the challenge for the theories then is how in the first 700 million years of the universe you generate galaxies, the first generation of stars that go supernova, that create the dust, yes. that then form, the, we can see in the galaxies that we're looking at in this picture, that's really so, so long ago and so far away. Herschel clearly is a great success. With a, how long is it going to last? Well, the coolant is predicted to last for about a three and a half years, and that really is what determines the lifetime of the mission. Once the coolant runs out, the telescope and the cameras warm up, and then we can't see out anymore. Well, now, let's uh, take an overall view. What would you say is the most important discovery made by Herschel so far? May I ask you, Chris, what do you say? Well, I think some of the work Herschel's doing on a very distant universe and working out the way these... Uh, these galaxies are clustering on large scales and it's telling us a lot about the, uh, the structure of the universe at much earlier times and how these galaxies were behaving and that tells us a lot more about how our galaxy uh, came to be here. For myself, the most interesting result, Patrick, is, is the fact that Herschel, for the first time, is linking together the cirrus, that we don't know what it is in the interstellar medium, with these regions where the next generation of stars, like our sun, are forming. And this really is the very, very earliest stage of star formation of where we came from and where the sun came from and where the planets came from. And, and that's really one of the things that Herschel is going to excel at. So all in all, we are learning more all the time. Derek, Chris, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Well, I'm delighted to say the skies outside are clear, so let's go into my garden outside my observatory and join Peter Lentz and Paul April. Good evening, Paul. Good evening, Peter. How's things? Fine.
fine. It's a beautiful night out there, isn't it? Lovely. I'm just taking this opportunity to look at the moon. Unfortunately, there isn't really much about for me this time of year. The planets are so low down and the moon's not that high. Well, it is a strange time of year, isn't it? Because the summer months just don't give you very much of a night sky, really. There isn't really long. But the one thing I really look forward to seeing is the Milky Way. Yes, of course, you do need a rather dark sight to see it in its uh, full splendour, don't you? You do. I mean, uh, if you live in a city, you tend to have light pollution and it blots it out as a perfect filter for the Milky Way. So the best advice there is if you can try and get out to somewhere darker. Now, you know, Patrick once described the Milky Way as rather like two fried eggs clasped back to back, which I think is a great this description. Is a classic <laughs> description. I like, I like to think of it like a, an island city of stars in space. It's about 100,000 light years across and mm, it contains yeah. several hundred billion stars. And we're about two thirds away across from the galactic centre, is that right? That's right. And in the summer months, we're actually looking more or less towards the core, the central part of the galaxy. Yeah, it's quite an interesting effect because the light doesn't extinguish as it goes down towards the horizon, does it? No, that's right. The, the Milky Way, which is fairly high up, that's looking away from the core a bit, and the core is actually very low down on the southern horizon. Hmm. So as you're looking along the line of the Milky Way, you'd expect it to get dimmer because the atmosphere would block out the light hmm. from the stars. Hmm. But because the core is getting brighter, it actually compensates. So you can see the Milky Way run all the way down to the horizon if you get a nice dark, clear night. So where would you go in Selsey? Well, we're on the coast, of course. Mm. So why don't we go down to the beach? Let's do that. OK. Now, this is a marvellous spot, Peter. It's pretty good, isn't it? I yeah. mean, it, it's dark and we've got a lovely flat horizon to the south. And you can really see quite a few constellations and stars, uh, in particular Sagittarius, which I can't see from my garden. That's right. I mean, Sagittarius and Scorpius, Scorpius is off to the right of mm. it, are very low constellations, very difficult to see from many places in the UK. But here we've got the benefit of having a flat southern horizon. Yeah. Now, Patrick will hate me for saying this, but it, to me, it just looked like one thing, and that's the... Teapot! <laughs> yes. It does look like a teapot. Well, a little bit. It looks a little bit like a teapot. Of course, the centre of the galaxy is located very near the teapot. That's exactly right. Just off to the right of the spout is where the centre of the galaxy is. And if you take some binoculars, there's uh, plenty to be seen. There are. It's a wonderful area of the sky to look at with binoculars. If you can imagine where the spout is mm -hmm. and you point your binoculars at the tip of the spout and then move up as if you're following a cloud of steam going up, oh, God, there are some fantastic <laughs> objects. You've got nebulae, globular clusters and open clusters there. Yes, beautiful sights. And of course we continue straight on up to Cygnus. Now there the galaxy does something very strange, doesn't it? Ah yes it does. It, it appears to split and the reason for this is that there is an intervening gas and dust cloud in the way and that blocks the light from the much more distant stars. But it's got a rather ominous name as well. It's called the yeah. Cygnus Rift. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> Lovely science fiction. And deep sky objects are not the only thing, I'm told. We have noctilucent clouds. Ah, yeah, fantastic noctilucent clouds. I have never seen one. Well, June and July are the perfect months to try and see them. They're about 50 miles up. So you... normal clouds are only about 10 miles up, so quite a way up. That's right. And they're illuminated when the sun is actually between 6 and 16 degrees below the horizon. Right. So basically, when you've got that sort of twilighty glow, the sun's rays are blocked from illuminating normal clouds, they're, mm -hmm. too, they're too low down, but they, it can get up above the curvature of the Earth oh, and illuminate these much higher altitude noctilucent clouds. And not just noctilucent clouds, I'm told we might have a bright comet. Ah yes, this is C2009R1 McNaught. Right. Now this is going to be moving, if you look towards the north, it's sort of moving from the right to left, if you like, throughout June. <laughs> it starts off at the beginning of June underneath the constellation of Andromeda, mm -hmm. and then it moves in the middle of June to the constellation of Perseus. It's quite close to the star Murfak right. at that time. So you can find that underneath the W shape, which is Cassiopeia. Indeed. And it should be quite bright, shouldn't it? It gets, they're estimating it's going to be about Mag 4.2, which is well oh, within yes. naked eye brightness. But of course, you've got that twilight sky and you've got the moon coming in towards the end oh, of the month. So, so fingers crossed, but do keep a look out for that. Perfect for binoculars. Yeah, it'd be a good thing to go and have a look for with binoculars. Mm. Well, Peter, it looks like the summer's not going to be too dull after all. I'm really looking forward to it. Let's have a look at the galaxy. OK. Next month, we'll be talking about light echoes. Until then, for me and Ptolemy, good night. Mm -hmm.